Hi everyone, I'm Chris Boylan. I'm the owner and director of Zero Seven Animation. And really, as an independent animator, this is just a fancy way of saying, I'm Zero Seven and I make animation. I started my career as a character artist and technical director working at places like Leica and Blur Studio. Um, but I eventually found that my passion for 2D animation brought me to Titmouse where I, was, uh, I had the privilege of working on several great projects, the Area 21 music video anthology, Pantheon, which is a great cyberpunk um, animated TV show, and the Pokemon uh, spot for the Miss Magus promo. Uh, I've prepared a quick demo reel for you all, and I am very proud to say that everything on this demo reel um, was produced with Blender as the primary program. <laughs> Do it now. <gasps> So, why are we here? As you may or may not know, I love Japanese animation. Specifically, I love Japanese animation from the uh, late 80s to late 90s. Um, I feel like this represents a pinnacle of cell animation, what cell animation could achieve. These, uh, these are, for example, Venus Wars, uh, Gundam 0083, Ghost in the Shell, obviously, is a huge influence on my work, and uh, Cowboy Bebop. But how do we achieve this in CG? So we start with a master study, and you can see here in this footage that um, due to the fact that we have these high-quality Blu-ray transfers, we're able, to, we're able to view these great works in a higher fidelity than we ever have before. And so what this reveals to us here is the different techniques that they used to create this, this animation. So we can see here that we have, um, there's a drop shadow uh, on this character's left arm, you can notice in the frame, and that is due to the fact that the cells actually had a thickness, even though they're very thin, and when you piled them up, they would cast drop shadows um, on the different layers below. Um, you can see there's an airbrushing effect on the motorcycle canopy, and um, there's uh, a slight jitter to all the lines, the, uh, the actual line art is very uh, dark and looks very high fidelity. And this is due to the fact that the lines were Xeroxed onto the cell itself um, from, with a transfer method. Um, there's actual lines around the shadows. Those were added after the fact and drawn on top of the cell. Um, and uh, you can see that the characters themselves are, um, they're essentially exhibiting what's called limited animation. Uh, limited animation has only developed further since this time, but at this stage, this was a, a, about as high quality as you, you, you could get. And you can see how all the characters are moving on different frame rates. This is a mixing of twos, threes, fours, and fives, depending on uh, what kind of effect you want to get. You can even see in the background the characters aren't even moving. And then the last thing that I'd like to point out about this is if you fix your eyes on any point in the background, you'll notice a subtle camera jitter. This is due to the fact that the cameras were fixed above the cell, so you couldn't ever, you couldn't ever get rid of um, any ambient building shaking or vibrations because of the way that the camera was shooting down onto the cell itself. So this is a clip from Gundam 0083, and the things that I want to point out here are, if you notice when the mech gets cut in half, there's a, a slight pink haze around the smoke. This was another way that they used to do glow. So they would airbrush, for example, in the previous clip, they would airbrush on transparency, 
and then they would also airbrush around uh, you know, things that they wanted to diffuse or things that they wanted to glow. Um, the second thing I want to point out in this clip is the, uh, the secondary glow, the, the bloom glow. Um, that was it's a very interesting technique. They, they would actually take the cell, they would expose it, and then they would double expose it. And the second exposure, they would uh, paint all of the areas they didn't want to glow black. And then they would shine a light up through the cell. And that would create this really nice diffuse glow in the camera. And it, you can actually notice that there's a yellow tint to the glow um, when the robot gets cut in half. That, I believe, is uh, achieved by putting a, like a, a gel between the light source and the actual cell to create that tinted glow. Um, this is something that uh, Evie's Bloom filter does very, very well. Uh, but since I believe uh, Bloom is going to be deprecated in EV Next, you can actually replicate this technique in, com in the compositor by uh, grabbing a glare node, setting that to fog glow, and then piping that through uh, with an add node. So this last clip here, what I want to highlight to you is, if you've ever tried to paint water-based paint onto plastic, you'll know it's extremely difficult to get a fully opaque coat on, on the plastic. And so if you look very carefully, you can actually see the truck through the character here. Um, and so this is something that I feel like uh, because with the advent of digital coloring, you can get the colors perfect every single time. You're really missing that. It's not something that you, you notice immediately, but you definitely feel it. This, this subtle color, color jitter that, that happens when you're, you're dealing with actual painted cells, right? So I wanted to figure out a way to bring that into the world of digital animation. All right, so with this, we have the elements of 90 cell animation. You have the drop shadows from the cells, the Xerox line transfer effect, the shadow lines themselves uh, outlining the shadows, the two different types of jitter, the uh, two different types of glow, the downshooter camera shake, the use of limited animation, and then the, uh, the last thing here are the two different aspect ratios, the 1851 and the 43, which both represent um, unique uh, opportunities for filmmaking. So from this, an idea took shape, and I decided that I had this old test where I rotoscoped over some CG animation, and I wanted to take that and process it through a prototype uh, acetate shader. So you can see here, um, we have our character. The lines are really nice and, and dark. They're, the Xerox transfer is working really well. Um, the cell itself is, is casting a drop shadow on the background. I actually uh, developed from this a background shader as well because the backgrounds are um, water-based colors on paper. So I wanted to give it a more diffuse effect. Um, the glow from the bottom of the frame is not a gradient. It is an actual lit emissive object that is just slightly out of camera. So it's actually casting a bloom over the, uh, over the frame. And I figured that, I, I, th I thought just based on my studies that this is probably how they would have gone about creating a glow at the bottom of the frame. Rather than adding another cell with an airbrushed gradient on it, they would just put a light right outside the camera so that it casts a bloom effect. Um, the other thing here is that um, the colors really popped, and this is something that, that uh, we'll come back to, but what I noticed was when I started shining a light down onto the cell, it actually created a different effect with the colors, which is really interesting to, to see. Um, and the last thing here is that I just added uh, procedural noise uh, that emulates dust and grime and any sort of stuff that gets stuck to the cell because it was plastic and you could never really get it clean. So with this test completed, I developed what I'm calling my hybrid method pipeline, essentially blending uh, Blender and uh, 2D animation, traditional animation techniques together. So first we start with the CG rig. Uh, you can see here that I have my CG character all modeled. The hair is flipping uh, to emulate essentially what happens in 2D animation where the hair is staged to camera. The rig is uh, what I call a full broken hierarchy there is no IK in this rig, and this rig is essentially designed to pose the character exactly as I want to in any way that I want to. Um, I want to I want to essentially emulate the, the process of composing a drawing, so I've given myself complete control over the character here. Um, as we zoom into the face, you can see that uh, the jaw itself is uh, fully posable. I've separated out the jaw itself from the chin so that you can do the mouth flaps by lengthening the face a little bit and opening and closing the mouth. 
The eye is uh, completely posable. This facial rig is completely deformer based. There are no shape keys on this, this rig. Um, and I find that gives me the maximum flexibility uh, when it comes to uh, posing the character out. The grease pencil lines are mapped onto the surface of the character and those are gonna be used as landmarks for my 2D animation. From here, uh, I create model sheets. Uh, these are essentially just blueprints for the actual uh, character animation. So this is where I wanna make sure that I'm careful about where I wanna put my lines, where I wanna put my details. You can see I have the, the full turnaround and a facial expression sheet. Um, and I knew that I was going to uh, be animating a sequence where his, the character's helmet opened. Uh, so I wanted to include a pose with the helmet closed and the helmet open. From here, uh, we continue on to color design. Um, and the interesting thing about this slide is that the color, the color key on the um, right side of the screen, I actually found this on Twitter. This is actually the, the actual color key that the manufacturer would send to the studios for them to order the colors. So if you actually go to this website called Set Day Dreams, uh, and you check the Gundam Wing uh, set day, you can see these color codes on the actual character sheets, match them up, and, and see what colors they use to, to actually fill the characters in. So once this uh, color sheet is complete, we can now move on to the next step of the production, which is, again, pretty straightforward. I just used uh, static boards to enforce the constraints that they themselves would have used, right? So I'm, I'm at this point, I'm thinking about camera moves, I'm thinking about animation layers, I'm thinking about everything that's going to go into the production from this stage, right? I'm not going into animatics. I'm not going out of my way to use modern techniques. I just want to get in the mindset of the artists um, and what they were thinking and how they were going about uh, doing this. Um, to that effect, I actually ended up buying a mechanical stopwatch. Um, and I feel like this helps me visualize the scenes a little bit more. You can, you click the watch, you 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 close your eyes and you, you look at the scene and then once the scene is over, you click the watch again. And this scene actually turned out, um, it says five plus zero, which is five seconds plus zero frames. This scene actually ended up being four and a half seconds, so four plus 12 frames. So from here, I basically take the final board frame, I blow it up, I put it in the camera background and I create my layout. Once I've created my layout here, I'm also thinking about how the character interacts with the different objects in the scene, what cell layers uh, are gonna be included with each other, when the cell layers separate, etc. cetera. Um, after I've completed this, I take this pose and I export it to TV Paint. From here, I create my 2D layout. Uh, this is where the key line art is established. Um, the shadow lines have been added. The uh, background and character layers are all separated. So you get the background, the character, and the foreground layers. So from here, we are just gonna go straight to uh, CG animation. Um, this is straightforward. This is essentially just animating the character as if um, we were animating a CG scene. The only difference here is that um, when I'm animating, I'm trying to take into consideration what objects are gonna be on what cell layers because I don't want to have too much jitter or overlapping motion um, on the same cell layers. And the reason that, that we want to do this is uh, essentially, you know, there's a lot of details in that chair and I want to make sure that I don't have to redraw that chair too many times. Uh, you know, me mechanical animation is always difficult and time consuming. So you want to make sure that all the objects that are going to be on the same cell layer move on the same frames. And there, there are a couple of frames where the, the, uh, the chair and the uh, heads up display actually do um, offset each other. Um, but that's fine for this, for this uh, example here. So from here, the animation is exported to TV Paint. This is where I rotoscope over the CG using those grease pencil landmarks that I uh, pre-planned out. Um, you can see here now that the shadow lines have been added and all of the layers are separated out. Uh, and actually, uh, the character himself is interacting with the chair until he's not interacting with the chair and he becomes his own cell layer. After this, we do the color fills. Um, you can see here that there is a slight airbrush effect on uh, the static elements of the uh, of the mech. I found that the old school anime used to do this a lot, especially in like sci-fi, uh, where they would have a really, really nice drawing of a mech that they didn't want to necessarily animate. So they would um, airbrush it and then kind of just slide the cell across the frame. 
And we do a really nice detail pass and highlight pass and everything. Um, and so I wanted to get this in my work, but I knew that the canopy still needed to feel integrated into all the other elements. So I actually hand painted the airbrush effect on the canopy and I feel like it gives it a really lively feeling and a really nice uh, effect there. So because this is a method uh, workflow, I decided to paint the background by hand. Um, this, you know, you could achieve a, a, a Starfield background in Blender relatively easy, uh, Voronoi texture um, with a clip on a world uh, essentially would do the same thing. But I really wanted to control the details here. So you can see this takes place in an asteroid field. So there's some clouds, there's some dust coming up underneath, some ice crystals that I'm painting in here. And I wanted to control the overall layout and composition of the image, right? I, I wanted to make sure that the image felt balanced. And I, I feel like you, that's not something that you can as easily create with uh, uh, procedurals here. So just painting in stars and ice crystals. So from here, we move on to the compositing of the, uh, the whole thing. So we put this all together. Um, the camera shake is applied with motion tracking. So essentially what I did was um, using Blender's motion tracking feature, I actually sampled the camera shake from old school anime and rebuilt the camera. So I have real camera shake from old school anime in the scene here. Um, the lit cells obviously produce real drop shadows. I'm shooting them from both sides here, um, and that creates a really, really nice diffuse shadow that's not too hard, and, and it's a really nice effect. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the color vibrancy response to light, this is something that really hit me um, when I started actually shining lights down onto the cells because the, um, because the lines are Xeroxed on top, they actually have their own shader built into the, to the network. And if you've ever kind of like angled a cell, if you've ever handled a cell, you can see that when the light kind of dances across the plastic, it hits the lines in a different way. And it, and it you know, it, it really stood out to me when I, when I was handling a cell. So I wanted to make sure to emulate that effect in the actual uh, shader itself. Um, finally, the opacity jitter is procedurally driven. Um, I essentially just took Christoph Dedeen's uh, Ghibli Rocks tutorial repurposed that, created like a paint strokes, tied that to a null, and on the frames that actually move, I'm animating the null to jitter the paint strokes so that the opacity is constantly jittering just slightly, ever so slightly, so to create a liveliness in the, in the actual animation. Um, after that, I, I commissioned an excellent composer by the name of Cooper Maiden and rendered it out. That's my talk. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Autotroph and CG Cookie for all their hard work and effort in hosting the Blender Conference in LA. And uh, I want to extend a special thank you to Dylan Goo for inviting me. Um, I look forward to more Blender conferences in the future and uh, hope you all have a great day. Peace out.